Xbox in because my laptop broke two days ago. Uh, all right, good. So uh, I'm going to try to focus on Python and TensorFlow here. Um, but really, the context of what we're doing, uh, I sort of have to spend a few minutes on that just so that it makes a little more sense and might be more interesting. Uh, my company, Prediction Machines, uh, is doing deep learning and predictions in transactional markets. Uh, so that includes financial markets, that includes like energy markets, that includes like digital advertising. So there's a lot of transactional markets where people are exchanging something of value in an exchange. There's buyers and sellers, and sometimes they intersect and there's an execution. So that's the kind of stuff we're working with. Uh, let me move relatively quickly. Uh, thank you to the Python group and thank you Zendesk. Um, so traditionally in financial markets, uh, people are doing statistical <coughs> that involve a lot of micromanagement of signals and features. And it's a lot of work, uh, labor intensive. And uh, these machine learning systems are very played out now. Uh, so markets are generally efficient to it. So there's not a lot of profit to be made. Uh, but what we see is certain traders can continually make good profit in markets. And the strategies that they're employing are a lot more complex than what the traditional machine learning strategies are. And that complexity means that so far people haven't really been automating it um, because there's so, uh, some magical intuition that certain traders have about the markets. They can look at the data, somehow they collect that data and it's almost like a black box. They're like, okay, I know. I need to buy and sell. Um, so what we're doing with deep learning is learning these complex strategies, uh, which is one level above what is traditionally done, which is just statistical predictions. Um, so we took the inspiration from what DeepMind did, which was purchased by Google. Uh, what they did is back in 2015, they built a neural network and uh, had a few additional features that really put it through to make it effective. And the interesting thing is they, they taught it to learn how to play Atari, and uh, they didn't actually tell it the rules of the game. So all it was doing was looking at the screen, like visually, and uh, moving the paddle randomly, and it just figured out at some point how to play the game, how to score high, and most of the results are much better than what humans can do. So we took this inspiration uh, and decided uh, maybe we should model the markets uh, like a game and uh, use some of these results from DeepMind and uh, go beyond that. Um, so we implemented deep learning methods, uh, these neural networks, and uh, played the transactional market space as a game. Um, so again, the comparison between traditional NL and deep learning is deep learning is on the left, um, basically a kid doesn't really know the physics of the bicycle. Like, they just get on it, they try something, if they do well, they get a reward, if they fail, they will try again and do something different. Um, whereas on the right, you have to model the bicycle physics, and it's a bunch of math, and it takes a lot of people, and a lot of cost, and you can't actually take that and apply that model to a bigger bicycle anymore but the kid can get on a bigger bicycle and ride it just as well. Um, so in reinforcement learning, uh, there's always a feedback loop where you have an environment that has a state. That state could be, for example, the, the price of the stock, or it could be um, the volatility of some index fund or something. And you have an agent that's acting on that environment. And so what, the, what happens is the agent will observe the environment. It will make a decision about what action to take. That action will influence the environment. And the environment will then be observed by the agent. So you've got this feedback loop. And uh, the reinforcement learning part is the reward. So when you play a game in this environment, you'll get a reward or a penalty. And that's the feedback that you get. Uh, there's examples online. Um, this is a JavaScript example. Uh, you can look up Parthi. Um, it's a, so GridWorld shows you, in, in reinforcement learning, there's sort of three key things. 
There's a value function, which tells you how good is this state that you're in. There's a policy, which tells you what action should I take given the state. And then there's a reward, which is given by the environment. <coughs> now, I'm moving very fast because I want to show you code. Uh, so we created a game where we discretize, uh, like for in this example, it's a pairs trade. So it's a spread between two different assets. And they are correlated in some fashion. So what you expect is as one asset moves, the other one will move in a predictable manner. But it's not always going to stay at, at the same. So you get a mean reverting instrument. And this doesn't just apply to finance. This applies to many different transactional markets. So we discretized it into a lattice. And this lattice is a state machine that will uh, move based on time which is the stock market moving, uh, but also as you buy or sell, you're affecting the state of the machine also. So that's the feedback part. Um, I just want to get into code as quick as I can. Uh, on our blog, we have a demonstration of this game uh, done in JavaScript. Uh, so you can play it, you can choose when to buy or sell. Um, and it, um, so that's, that just gives you a good example of how we're doing it. So once you formulate the game, uh, then you have to build a, a brain that's going to actually learn how to play it. Uh, so this example code here is uh, available. <coughs> We've open sourced this code. It's called Trading Gym. Uh, Trading Gym is modeled after the OpenAI Gym, which is uh, Elon Musk endeavor. Uh, so this is an open source project where we've implemented the trading game and uh, the data generators. So we, we can simulate data, or we can plug in actual market data. And uh, in this example, we have a Keras implementation, which will learn how to play that trading game. And this is all open source. Um, so Keras is higher level than TensorFlow. So this example code here is 10 lines, and it's an entire network that you see on the left there. Um, so it, it's quite simple to use Keras. Um, my demo is doing TensorFlow, and uh, I'll tell you why uh, I'm showing TensorFlow rather than Keras. Uh, so in TensorFlow, the demo I'm giving is this network, which is more complex than that previous one. Uh, the reason is that uh, DeepMind has made some improvements since 2015, and I'm implementing some of the current state-of-the-art system. And the cool thing is the code I'm demoing is also available on our GitHub uh, for you guys. Um, so you can also play with the more complex stuff that I'm going to show. So this is the architecture that, uh, that, that we have up on GitHub. Uh, the trading gem in that box is open source. And it has two main modules, uh, a data generator and an environment. So this is sort of plug and play. Like you can use any environment with any data generator. And uh, also, it's quite easy to write your own data generator and environment. And that's why I want people to fork the code and actually write some of that themselves and contribute. Um, so we have example data generators that are random, that are deterministic. Uh, you, can, you can use a CSV version, which lets you just plug whatever data you have personally into it. Um, or we have not open source, but we can plug in actual market data. Uh, and then the environment has different transactional models. So there's single asset, multi-asset, uh, market making models, um, etc. And the API is very simple. Uh, the data generator just has a next, which gives you the next value. And uh, the environment has a step, which given an action, it will give you a reward and the next state. So Basically, two API functions you have to implement, very basic uh, and easy to use. And then all the other stuff I have there is in the trading brain. And, um, and here we have sort of a, a, rep, a recommended architecture. Uh, so you have an agent that is acting and observing the environment. And then that agent has a brain that is, uh, it doesn't even have to be a deep network. It could be uh, any learning Album. Uh, and usually there's a memory uh, also. So let me bounce very quick to the other slides and then I'll be ready to show you. 
Right. So uh, this, um, the reason I did this is this will be available uh, tomorrow if you go to our blog. Um, so you can download these PDFs and you can read the papers uh, because without explaining anything, um, I can show you the code and I can explain what that code's doing, but you won't understand why. And you have to read the papers to understand why. Uh, more details about what's in those papers. Um, I'll skip that. And here's just a high level comparison. Uh, Keras is a, it's on top of TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow is low level, and uh, Keras is a uh, much higher level. Um, the main reason I like TensorFlow is that when I read the papers, they have all the math in there and the derivations. And if you don't understand that very well, and you're just using Keras, then uh, you'll get stuck uh, with more complicated problems. So if you use TensorFlow, you can actually directly program in that, that math, like almost line for line. So it's much closer to what you're reading in the papers, whereas Keras sort of hides everything from you. Um, so uh, I run everything on Linux. Uh, CentOS was a little harder to install. I found one good blog that's one version previous of CentOS. Uh, for how to install, um, and then Ubuntu is quite easy because Google sort of supports that directly. Um, one thing is that I did build from source, and that's because if you don't, uh, you don't get all of the compiler optimizations in from the hardware. So uh, I think it's important to get the source code for all of the libraries and packages and build it yourself. Um, but you don't have to. Um, it's just going to run a lot slower uh, if you're running it from the binaries. So people don't really know what TensorFlow is. Uh, if you took computer science, you'd know graph theory. And um, you know, it's, uh, basically, TensorFlow is, is just a graph implementation. Um, there's nothing specific about it that makes it deep learning. Uh, so the, way, the reason it works well for deep learning, though, is that neural networks are um, represented mathematically as a graph. So you've got neurons, uh, nodes. They're in layers and they're connected to each other. So you've got nodes and edges. It looks like this. Uh, TensorFlow will automatically compute the, uh, the computational graph, which means you can throw data at the inputs and you can request any of the output nodes. And TensorFlow figures out the optimal way to compute that for you. So generally with TensorFlow, you create your graph first and then later, you can just run it by giving it inputs and requesting outputs. And you don't have to worry about what's going on inside. Uh, the, more the more complicated thing is the, uh, the gradients that TensorFlow is computing. Uh, there's a lot of um, optimization necessary for doing it well. And TensorFlow handles all of that optimization. Uh, so that's all nice, magical, internal. So uh, basically, the takeaway from that is TensorFlow is a computational graph solver, and it's not, it's not something that's specific to deep learning. Um, so I'll leave it on this slide because uh, I'm going to bounce to the code now. Um, but this slide is going to show you sort of some of the core uh, functions that TensorFlow uses, um, and I'll show you the code where I'm using it. Um, so in TensorFlow, you, you often use namespaces because you can actually produce graphs and understand what's happening very well with TensorBoard, which is a visualization tool that they provide. Um, you, you can create multiple sessions if you want. And so for example, if you're parallelizing the algorithm, you can have multiple sessions that interact with each other that have their own graphs. Or you can just use one session, which is what I'm doing in this demo. Uh, furthermore, you have to define the graph. So to do that, you have variables which are placeholders or they're actual variables. So placeholders are sort of you're defining a slot in memory that is not occupied at the moment. And at some point, to be able to make a computation, you have to put something in that placeholder. Uh, and then you have variables which are occupied with something. Uh, often these are internal. So you have maybe an input node that's a uh, placeholder. And then you have variables internally. And then you have an output node. And the variables internally will get computed automatically. Uh, or you can request that value if you want. Uh, whereas the placeholders, you need to externally plug something into it. 
Uh, and then to actually run the computation, uh, you have two options. There's a run, which is under the session, and then there's any given variable you can call eval on to evaluate it. Uh, so in either case, uh, whatever you're trying to get as an output, you have to give it the necessary input. So if one node in your graph requires two inputs, then to be able to call the eval on that node, you have to give it both of those inputs that it needs. Uh, the same with the run. Uh, run allows you to run multiple variables in parallel, uh, whereas eval can only do one at a time. Uh, so, and these, so my top example is, is just an eval on the output, which is Q underscore action, and the input here, which is S underscore T, uh, and then the run, I'm calculating two values, a Q and a loss, and I'm giving it two inputs. So let me, all right. So this part is going to be interesting. I've never tried this in front of people. Um, I have my code in front of me, and I also have something that's helpful, which is TensorBoard. Um, so TensorBoard, you see it's running locally. Uh, and it's reading a log folder that I generated from a previous run. Uh, so if you look at graphs, we can start out by just looking at the structure of my code. Um, and then I can actually show you the code. So we have uh, six different uh, namespaces here. We have step, prediction, target, optimizer, cred the target, and summary. Um, step is simply a counter that just tells you what step am I on currently. Um, it's needed for TensorBoard because when you do a graph, you have a X axis, which is the time or the number of ticks. And in my case, that's defined by step. Uh, so that's not actually part of the learning system. You see it's not even connected to anything else. Um, we have a prediction network, which is a deep Q network. Um, this is, uh, in my case, it's the picture on the back of my shirt. That's what it looks like. So uh, it's got input nodes, hidden layers, output nodes. Um, and it's a little more complex than that. Uh, and then there's a target network, which is actually a copy of the prediction network. And the reason I did this is back in 2015, this is one of the three things that DeepMind figured out, which actually helped get good results. Um, so the target network is a clone of the prediction network. And only once every X number of steps do we copy that prediction network into the target network. And uh, we actually use the target network to compute the, the next state and the reward. Um, and the reason you do that is because the prediction network on every update, it changes, whereas the target network is a little more stable. And that basically, I just, I just said the word, it, it makes it more stable. Uh, this is what actually does the copying. So it's just an operator that will take all of the weights and biases from the prediction network and copy them into the target network. Uh, it's very easy because they're the same architecture, so you don't have to do any weird magic in there. And then there's an optimizer, which does the actual learning. Uh, in machine learning, uh, the most common method is uh, stochastic gradient descent. Um, so I'm using something different, which is called RMS prop. And, uh, Nobody knows what prop means, it's a mystery, um, but RMS means root mean square. <laughs> and it's similar to stochastic gradient descent, but better. Um, so I'm not gonna double click yet, because if, if I do, you'll freak out. So let me show you some code. Um, so this is my brain, which is where all of my tensor flow is inside of. Uh, from that architecture I showed you before, um, here, we're just looking at this part brain. Uh, there's also an agent in this code. There's a memory, there's a runner, there's everything else is there, but I'm just gonna show you the brain and we'll see how my time goes. Um, so the brain has these variable scopes, like I said, and these are gonna match those six things that we saw in TensorBoard. So uh, you start with a width and uh, it's nice because as soon as that block terminates, you're outside of that, and you don't have to keep track of which context you're in. Uh, so I'm naming it prediction. 
I'm creating my prediction network here, uh, and then I have output of that prediction network. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, if we go down, you see I have a target network, uh, and it's it's actually the same network as a prediction network. I just named it differently, uh, so it's the same architecture. Um, and then we go down, we see that we have the prediction to target section. So let me uh, let me explain this create net, uh, and then I'll go back up. Again. So here I'm defining the architecture of the network. And remember, this is inside a namespace that I defined in the previous uh, in the parent function. Um, first, we create a placeholder, and this placeholder is my input into the network. That input has to come from outside the network because it's coming from my environment. So that's why it's a placeholder and not just a variable. Uh, in TensorFlow, you define the shape of the variables. Uh, most often, it's going to be a matrix. And uh, can anyone guess what a more than two-dimensional matrix is called? Tensor. Yeah, tensor. Yeah. So that's the official. That's why they call it TensorFlow. Um, so this is a three-dimensional matrix. Uh, what's interesting is that the first entry is of size none. Second entry, second, second one is an integer, third one's an integer, this is none. So what's cool is, uh, let me go to TensorFlow. Let's look inside prediction. And we see my input is of size question mark by one by two. So the none actually means it's a variable size. And that's necessary because we do batch learning, which means you could, you could, cho you could choose to have it calculate for one observation, or you could throw in a batch size of 32 or 64, and you can learn much faster that way and much better uh, because we use experiential replay, which means we actually take 64, in this case 64, experiences from the past that we've observed, and we're plugging all, you know, this whole matrix into the system at once, and we get a batch learning output from that. So, uh, so let me go back to the code. Right, so that's what the none means, and then we give it a name, and uh, and the next thing I do is I flatten it, uh, because what you want that's going into your uh, hidden layers is a vector, um, a one-dimensional vector. So I flatten it, and then I have my first hidden layer, L1, level one. And in the TensorFlow, you define it by giving it the input, which is the previous layer. You give it the number of nodes that you want, and you give it an activation function. Uh, let me scroll down and show you that actual function there. Yeah. So this is the network, uh, the, the layer that I defined. Um, you see I have an input, I have an output dimension, which is the number of nodes inside that layer, and an activation function. And so I, in this case I have a nested variable scope. So you know that the parent, parent function has a variable scope called prediction. Uh, here, I've got a variable scope, which is the name of this layer, L1. Uh, and I define two variables inside there, uh, weights and biases. And, uh, and then I connect them all together using this mathematical <coughs> function, which is a matrix multiply uh, combined with an addition of the biases. So this is actually what you call a fully connected layer, um, quite standard. and. The reason that I'm storing everything uh, as I am, because uh, you don't have to store it internally. You can just create the computational graph and not actually save the variables. Um, it'll, it'll remember when you create them. Uh, I do that because later I, in TensorBoard, I can observe all of those variables. Uh, so one thing about deep learning is um, it can be very black box. Um, what I've done here is I've tried to expose all of the internals uh, through TensorBoard, but also uh, I've got quite a bit of code that helps expose more of that that's not part of TensorFlow. Um, 
what I like I manually produce uh, certain values and I plot them separately. Uh, so I'll go back up again. Um, right. So we have this layer L1, and we have an option now. Uh, either it's a dueling network or it's not. Uh, the dueling network is more complicated. It's got four different layers, whereas the non-dueling is just one more hidden layer in the output. Uh, the dueling network is a little harder to explain. Uh, it's in those papers I posted. But the pattern is the same. Uh, you define a new layer. Oops. I didn't know. All right. So you define a new layer. And you give it an input layer and an output size and an activation function. So that's the pattern I'm following. Uh, once you learn a few key functions in TensorFlow, you can build a, whatever architecture you want quite easily. Um, so I will continue. I will continue back up here again. Uh, assuming that we understand how we build this architecture, uh, the next thing is this copy function. So in TensorFlow, you can define operators on the variables. Uh, they actually name the operators rather than, I guess in Python, it's a little harder to do operator overloading. Uh, you can do it, uh, but I guess they didn't want to do it because non-C++ programmers might be a little bit thrown off by operator overloading, potentially. I'm not sure exactly why, but this could be an equal sign, but they made it dot assign. So what we're doing is we're assigning to this target network, the, uh, this variable, which I defined in the previous line, as a placeholder, uh, which has the same shape as the target. Um, and later on, I actually will execute this uh, to copy the network. So this is, because it's based on a placeholder, it's just sitting there waiting to be executed. Uh, it's in the network, but it's not being run until I actually call it. And uh, I think, as I said, like, only once every so often do I call it. And that's because I want the target network to be more stable than the uh, prediction network. Um, now, to read this optimizer code, I recommend going from bottom to top. Uh, and that might apply to quite a bit of what you're doing with TensorFlow. Um, either you think in terms of what's the input, and, uh, and or you think in terms of what is my target, what do I want out of it. So, Starting at the bottom, uh, which you could do with the architecture, like I want the result to be this, how do I get that? Uh, the same with the, same with the optimization. So I'm going to start with the target, which is I want to do this optimizing uh, to, to train my network. So how do I do that? Uh, the optimizer requires, it requires a loss function. Uh, what is my loss function? Uh, let's go up one line. Um, well, a little aside, these, this line of code here is just uh, to decay the learning rate exponentially. Um, that's something you want to do when you're optimizing uh, most of the time because as it's learning, you want it to uh, sort of settle in on the zone that, that's good. Uh, and if you don't decay the learning rate and it stays steady, then as it gets better, it's going to continue to sort of wildly explore, and that's not going to give you good results. So this is just an exponential decay uh, learning rate, which you use, which can be, it's an optional input in this optimizer. So we can go ahead, and here I have my loss function, which is what I feed the optimizer. Uh, the loss function, um, so the concept is pretty simple. Uh, your network is going to produce a certain output, and uh, then it's going to observe in the world that actually, you know, the, the real app that I got was different. Like it's not the same that I expected. Uh, basically, you just take the difference between those two things. Uh, usually, you square it and you take the square root, and um, that's called the mean squared error. And that's what the loss is going to be. Uh, so I largely did that, except um, one additional. Uh, benefit is to use this Hoover function, which looks very similar to MSE, but it's um, 
it's a little more clipped, so it's not, yeah, it's sort of like a clipped mean squared error. Uh, so um, that's what my loss is, and as I said, it's on the error. So my error, I define here as the difference between the target, which is what did I want, and what did I actually calculate, which was not correct. Um, so I, cal I compute that here, and the way I do that is my target is a placeholder, and that's because uh, it's coming from outside. Uh, but my, and, and also my actual queue is computed previously and stored locally um, here. So to be able to call this optimization function, uh, you, can, you can tell that the thing I have to do is give it the target queue, because that's, that's required to compute this. And I also have to have my current queue uh, pre-computed. So those are the two things you have to have to be able to learn with this network. Um, I can go back to TensorBoard, and we can look at this optimizer. And you can see uh, various things here. So it's using RMS prop. Uh, it has a magic box of gradients that it's figuring out for you, um, very complex. The same with this whole graph, which is computing on its own. Um, and I have an exponential decay variable that I'm applying. Um, and you see that the prediction network is what feeds into it. Uh, and also we have the action, which is uh, used for calculating the actual Q value. Um, one thing I didn't mention was what is Q. Uh, Q is this magic thing which tells you uh, how good is my policy. Um, so given a state that you're in, uh, what is the value of the various decisions that I could potentially make? And so it's a big matrix that has all of the states, all of the potential actions, fill out that matrix with numbers that represent how good or bad this is. Um, so that's a Q matrix. And that's why we're calling it a DQ. It's a deep Q network. Um, so let me go back to the code. Uh, so that's really building the, the network, and I'm done building it. Uh, the next thing to do is actually to run the thing. Um, so the brain has uh, two main functions for running. It has predict right here, which we give it a state, and it gives you an action. And that action is going to be based on its Q values. So you see here that my action is equal to this Q underscore action eval. So what is Q action? Uh, we can go back up to the top real quick. I hope you don't get dizzy. Um, my Q action is defined as the arg max of my Q. So the network outputs three values in my case. Uh, one of them is should I buy? One is should I sell? And one is uh, should I do nothing? And uh, the action that we're choosing is the maximum of those three values. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, so I'll go back down. So that's all I do. It's one line. Uh, action equals Q action dot eval. And um, that's called a forward pass. So in the network, you give it an input, which in my case is the state. That's my input. And you get an output, which is the action. Uh, and then um, we have a train function, which is the backwards pass. Uh, that's where we do our learning. Uh, so for train, we're running. As I said, we have to first calculate the Q value. And then using that, and also the target, we can compute the, we can actually do the training. So here, I'm running multiple things. I'm running in parallel, I'm running the Q function, I'm running the loss function just because I want to display it, not because I have to. Uh, and I'm running the optimization, um, which is the core thing. So I can run all of those in parallel, and these are the four inputs necessary to be able to do that. 
Uh, so in the API design, uh, you want to make it such that uh, the minimum things you need to be able to run something are what you give it. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to mess up the API or making it too complex. So in my case, all I need is the state, the target, uh, the action, and the step because I'm exponentially decaying my learning rate as I progress. So I need to know what stage of the game am I in. Uh, so that's all you need. Uh, I'm outputting the result uh, to TensorBoard using um, a rider that I create. So TensorFlow has a writer API that lets you, it's very rich, you can define whatever stuff you want to show in TensorFlow. Um, the other core thing, which is part of reinforcement learning, is this, uh, it's called the famous Bellman equation. Um, it's in the papers, uh, this is some of the math, and one difference again between TensorFlow and Keras is that in TensorFlow, I am actually writing the math out, and each line of that math is closely matching what you would be in the paper. Um, whereas in Keras, they will hide all of that from you, um, and you won't actually do it yourself, which is good if you're not a researcher and you know you only want some results. But if you're trying to actually develop new stuff, then uh, I think TensorFlow is easier for that. So what I'm doing with the Bellman equation is it's very simple concept. Um, we have we take an action now uh, in a video game. Let's say I'm playing Pong and I'm moving the paddle left or right. Uh, the ball right now is maybe one second away from actually hitting the paddle. Uh, at this moment, when I move the paddle, uh, it doesn't change the score. But if I don't move the paddle now, uh, in one second, when the ball comes, uh, the paddle is too far away, and I lose the game. So generally in games, uh, when you take an action, you get a reward, not necessarily immediately. You, you get it later. Uh, so what the Bellman equation does is it basically says the immediate reward here is added to a discounted future reward. And uh, the concept there is that maybe you want a cake. It, it's probably better to eat the cake immediately if it's available. Um, a cake five days from now is probably worth a little less than now um, because it doesn't taste so good. Uh, so the reward will decay over time. Um, so that's what this discount factor is. Uh, it's called the Bellman equation. Um, and it's quite, it's relatively simple here uh, if you're not doing a double Q network. If you're doing a double Q network, it's a little more complex. Uh, it involves making an action with one of the networks and evaluating the value of that action with the other network. So you're actually combining the two networks' outputs to produce the final result. Whereas with a non-double Q network, uh, you're using the same network to, to, make, to take the action as you are to evaluate the value of the action. And it turns out that double Q gets better results. And so that's, I've implemented that here. Um, so if we look at the agent, the agent also has a predict function. And the predict function, most of the time, is just going to call the brain's predict function. Uh, additionally, most uh, reinforcement learning agents will have an exploratory period at the beginning where they make random choices. And the reason you do that is because at the beginning, you don't know anything. It's like that kid on a bicycle. Um, they don't know what they're doing. So, you start out by making random choices, and uh, you learn from that. And uh, as time goes on, um, in my case, it's an exponential decay. Uh, as time goes on, you take less and less random choices, and you start to actually listen to your brain. Um, so that's what I'm doing here in the predict function for the agent. Uh, additionally, the agent will have this observe function. So after we take an action, the environment will produce a new state from that action and also a reward. And that's what's fed into this observe, because the agent is observing the result of what they've done. Uh, so in doing that, uh, we have to remember what we did, uh, because later on we're going to actually learn from our memories. Um, and uh, we have two things we do, and neither of them necessarily are every single iteration. 
uh, you can define how frequently you do these things. So the first thing you can do, uh, which in my case I do every time, uh, but you could change it to be every other time or every fifth time, uh, I actually do the learning. And that's the thing that takes up a lot of time uh, in TensorFlow. That's where you're computing all of the derivatives and that's the heavy math. Um, so if we look at that function, we see that we're using the brain. Uh, well, first, we have to sample the memory. So we're taking a batch size of 64 in my case, and we are sampling 64 past experiences. And then we're calculating using the brain, using the Bellman equation, we're calculating the, uh, the target Q values, which are um, what should those values be according to the Bellman equation. And then we call a train function, which takes the state and the target and the action. Uh, those are the three main ones. And uh, that's where we actually uh, do the gradient descent and learn. Um, so then the other one here is very basic. That's just uh, update target Q network. So I named it that because that's what it does. Uh, it takes the prediction network and it copies it into the target network. Um, so, how am I doing for time? Let me check. Okay. I'm almost done. All right. So that's the agent. Now, finally, we have uh, the main, the, the runner. Uh, the runner has just a simple for loop. That for loop here goes um, for the maximum number of steps I told it to do. And uh, in that loop, we have these beautiful three functions, uh, predict, which takes the current state of the environment um, and it makes an action on it uh, using the agent. And then the environment does a step, which uh, you, you give it the action that the agent took and then it computes the next state and the reward. Uh, additionally, it computes whether or not we're finished with the game. Uh, you need to know that. Uh, and then the agent will observe the result, the fruits of its labor. And uh, that's where it learns from its experiences. So these three things are really the core of that loop. Uh, everything else I have is boilerplate stuff for statistics management, like we get to see, you know, like I said, I tried to make it not a black box. So you actually see what's happening internally. So this is, one thing it does is it outputs pickle files, which uh, contain uh, rich data sets, um, and then it also outputs a CSV file, which you can analyze in MATLAB if you want, or you know, any other of your utilities. Uh, additionally, uh, whenever the thing does really well, uh, so, hey, I've, I've done a lot better than what I used to do, um, it goes ahead and saves the model um, to disk. So later, I can rerun this thing uh, with a minus L flag, and it's going to load uh, the model that it saved previously and run from there. Um, so that's my, my runner, the main loop. Uh, and I can now show you a couple demos uh, real quick and then I'll sum up. Um, so, one, so one demo is going to show the trading gym, uh, which uh, actually has a really nice visualization, uh, which I did not implement with TensorFlow version. Uh, so let me run that. Uh, that's my Keras example. Uh, let's see. I think I have this. Here. All right. Uh, okay, so people think that deep learning takes a really long time, uh, and it does if you're doing image recognition or speech recognition because the number of inputs are going to be massive. Uh, in my case, uh, I only have a handful of inputs and my hidden layers are of size 24, there's two of them, it's a pretty basic network. So I can actually train it in real time uh, in front of everybody. Uh, the loss is going to decrease because that's what I'm optimizing on. Um, EPS is the ex exploration rate, and uh, the reward is how much money we're making. So uh, this is the train network. Um, it's running on uh, simulated data, and the red arrows are sell, and the green arrows are buy. 
Uh, it gets penalized if, it's bu if it buys uh, multiple times in a row. It gets penalized if it sells multiple times in a row. So uh, the optimal result would be one buy and one sell at the top and bottom. Uh, so this is not optimal. Um, that's because I trained it in less than a minute. Uh, and you see that it's making a bunch of money. Uh, and there was nobody that told it the rules of the game. Uh, so that's the cool thing. Uh, we didn't tell it how to make money. Um, the environment just gives it feedback, says this is good, this is bad, and it learns. Um, so that's a nice visualization. That's using, this is available in our open source uh, trading gym. Uh, the other one is the TensorFlow that I was walking you through. Uh, it's structured the exact same, but the network is more complex. Um, before I run it, let me show you what it outputs in addition to TensorBoard. Uh, so I, I just did some matplotlib stuff to plot some of those pickled data sets. Um, so this was the run I did earlier today. Uh, you can see that the reward, which is green, uh, climbs up until 8, which is not optimum. 10 is optimum uh, in this case. And you can see that the penalty <coughs> imposed in, in drops to 0. The penalty, like I said, was if you buy uh, when you've already bought, or if you've sold when you've already sold. Uh, so that's one plot. Uh, the length of the game is optimum at four, because um, my lattice that I drew had five nodes. Um, and so if we buy at the bottom and sell at the top, that's one, two, three, four. Like, the length is four. So it's learned that buy at top, uh, buy at bottom, and sell at top. And then these are the Q values. Uh, so the Q values are very informative, but they only work for small networks. Um, if it's too big, then, I mean, it's already hard to read. Um, in my case, white means that our current state, uh, like our position in the market, is flat. Um, and red means that we're short, and green means we're long. Um, so this is when we're at the top of the market. So when we're at the top of the market, we expect the best thing to do is to sell. Uh, so that's actually what we have here with the dot dash line is uh, sell. So that's the best thing to do. Uh, that's what we learned in the Q function. Uh, the worst thing to do is to buy if we're already long because we're at the top. So why? Yeah, that's a bad idea. Um, so you see that that's a negative value uh, and um, this is the maximum. So this looks good. This is no longer a black box. Uh, we actually see that it's learned a strategy. It's learned uh, I need to sell at the top and I need to buy at the bottom. Uh, and then you can also look at the similar chart when we're at the bottom. So this one is when we're at the bottom. Uh, when we're at the bottom, you see that the maximum value thing to do is to buy if we're already short. That's the solid red line. Uh, the, the worst thing to do is this uh, green line, which is uh, to sell if we are long, um, which makes sense. So uh, visualizing the Q values is only possible with small networks, but uh, um, I mean, the code is there. Like, it'll run and it'll give you thousands of data points if you want it, but it's only able to be visualized because it's a small network. Uh, otherwise, you have to rely on TensorBoard. Um, so in TensorBoard, you can look at the variables that you've output. Uh, so I have um, my summary that I've chosen to output myself. Uh, so in this case, we have a, we can see the average Q value increasing. We can see the reward increasing. And towards the end, it, it settles in a bit. And uh, the average reward gets up to 10, which is uh, Optimum. That's the most you can get. And you can see that some of these graphs don't look that great. Uh, this is chaotic at the beginning, and then it actually sort of learns pretty quickly. Uh, or you could say it gets stuck at a local minimum. Um, so what you can do with TensorBoard is you can do multiple runs, and you can compare them uh, on top of each other. So let me do that. Uh, so let's change one of the values. So I have a configuration file. Uh, this is the Bellman equation discount. So uh, 
in the future, how valuable is this? Uh, I use 0.95, change that to 0.99 because a lot of the literature uses that. Not because anybody figured out mathematically and that's best, uh, because it's a bit of an art. Uh, let me run this. So, I've done, it looks like I typed something. Live demo. All right, good. Okay, so the first thing we see is the Q table that's output. Now we start out with random weights. So these things are basically, who knows what they're going to be? Like it's random. It starts out random. Uh, if we're short, then randomly it decides to sell all the time. So this is this is when we're at the bottom of the graph, and this is when we're at the top. Uh, so. You can see these Q values are just random stuff. Um, so now we see it's learning. Uh, the things to notice are the average reward. Generally, you want that to go up. Uh, you see the uh, exploration rate, which is here. So 25% of the time, we're making random decisions. Now we're down to 16% of the time. Uh, you see the maximum reward, minimum reward. Uh, you would want this minimum reward optimally to become 10, because then it's, it's doing the best thing it can do every single time. Uh, it's up to 8. It's not bad. Uh, it's almost done, 90%. So the average reward is moving up pretty well, and uh, it's about done. There it is. Okay. So it finished. We can see the Q values. Uh, when we're short, it learned that at the bottom it should buy, and otherwise it should do nothing. Uh, if we're long, it learned that at the top we should sell, otherwise we should do nothing. And if we're flat, it learns at the bottom to buy, and at the top to sell. So that's optimum, that's the perfect result. So now we can go back to TensorBoard, and uh, let's see if it updated. Otherwise I'll just kill it and restart it. There it is. So now we can make a comparison of what happened when I changed that discount rate. Uh, you can hover over it and it'll tell you like which is which. Um, but I think I'm running out of time. So this is great because now I can make comparisons and I can turn the art into a little bit of more science um, by producing all these plots and showing the results. And uh, so that was, that was my demo. Um, Let's see what else. I think that that's pretty much it. Let's see what else we got. Uh, so um, our GitHub is at prediction machines, prediction dash machines, and that's because our URL is also prediction dash machines. Um, and uh, we have this trading gym, uh, and then we also have the brain. Um, and uh, a lot of the brain was inspired by this GitHub uh, example called by people called Dev Sisters. Um, and then there's our GitHub account. And uh, we're hiring, uh, so we're looking for Python developers or uh, C++ developers. Um, so afterwards, you know, I've got business cards. And I'd like to talk to whoever's interested in coding some Python. Um, you don't have to be good at machine learning, actually. Uh, because we've got plenty of stuff for doing. Uh, so I guess uh, any questions now? Yes. Right. Right. And based on that, then you define the digital and MSC to find the MSC, right? Yeah. I was working on a grammar. I don't really have any data. So I think that I know based on the Right, yeah, yeah. Real, yeah. Estate. real estate, yeah, real estate, right? yeah, yeah. My problem was, you know, whenever I was running this, it took me eight hours to model based on, you know, one small data set. Right? Yeah. The problem was, every time I found that a plastic net and random forest was producing better results than the deep learning results. Yeah. And I use Keras. I, I don't know the internal magic, right. so I use Keras. Right. I don't know the TF function. So yeah. the, I'm not that, that I go deep into there. I just use the Keras library, yeah. Yeah. create a deeper and valuable logic. Yeah. And both of them were inferior to elastic net 
uh, and random forest. Yeah. So is this then depending on the choice you choose neural networks or? I think a lot of it, well, so for us, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were actually modeling our environment as close as we could to what the Atari's, Atari game were modeled as, because we were taking inspiration from the research that DeepMind did on Atari. Uh, so um, the domain needs to be similar enough to the research that you're applying. And if it's not similar enough, then it's, it might not be the, the right tool. Second problem on yeah. is categorical data. Yes, yes. Because yeah. most of the time when you get the feature data, yeah. it's mostly categorical, right? And then you need to convert it into a matrix or you use some pandas function to yeah. do that. Yeah. And the predictions were very way off when I use categorical mm. data. Yeah. Uh, we, we're not, we're not using categorical data in our uh, system. So um, I'm not sure about that one. Like, you know, generally categorical data, you're, you're doing like uh, SVMs and uh, regressions because you're trying to separate uh, sets of you know the space in, in a hyperplane. Um, so the it's not like so deep learning is, is a nonlinear mapping from you know one to another, and so in theory it can actually calculate these separation spaces to be nonlinear, but uh, in practice like it's you know it is a bit of an art, and uh, so I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> because I have this problem. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of input data do you use? Are you using any like market data and what frequency and mm -hmm. because it has learned that it has to buy it for what kind of cell at the top. Yeah. Which is fine. Which is great when you are trying to teach something to play a game. Yeah. Which has a set rules. But yeah. when you're looking at markets, yeah. what kind of data would you use to yeah. actually make an actual prediction? Right. Well so uh, we, we both use we use both uh, market uh, microstructure. So, um, which is tick level data, tick by tick uh, level book, 10, 10 orders, 10 levels wide. Uh, we use that, um, but additionally we inject um, more traditional signals that the traders look at, uh, such as like um, MACD or uh, stochastic barriers and you know, things like that. So, uh, Just technical analysis. Signals. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, we try to focus more on just simple market microstructure signals um, because those are the safest things to use. And in theory, uh, all of those other signals are actually generated from that. Like, so it's a superset. Uh, the example yeah. that you 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 were saying that you are using pairs trading and you are making a ratio and yeah. trying to figure that out. Yeah. But the mean reversion of a pair trade typically yeah. takes over. Like the typical old way of trading, yeah, yeah. like human way well, of trading, we, used yeah. to take like months to be reversed, right? Uh, right. Not, not, not with a pairs trade typically. Uh, mm -hmm. If these two instruments are highly correlated during the day, they're just going to be, it, it's an Einstein Bluenbeck process, is what we're doing, uh, OU process. Uh, so that is a mean reverting process that is ba it's basically in physics, it's modeled as a uh, spring. So you've got, uh, maybe I have a rubber band tied to my leg and I'm walking and uh, if I deviate too far, the force to pull me back gets stronger. Um, so that's one of the typical uh, models that people use uh, for pairs trades. And but if it's uh, a trending market, right? so there's a bad news on one of it, ideally it was a closure that I'm an arm yeah. or from the trade or something. Yeah. There, there's a lot of interesting detail to go into. Um, if it's trending, then most probably your model will say let's buy right? But it will keep on getting more spread because... Yeah, it, it very much depends on uh, what you throw at it. So if the traders are able to observe that it's trending, then what we want to make sure of is that this, uh, this nonlinear function mapping is able to uh, learn the same thing that they're doing. So can we identify that it's trending versus mean reverting? And that's something that, that we are able to do. Yeah. One other thing I have to ask is, you're taking a tick data, and you said you took 10 ticks to train it? Yeah. The 10 ticks is like? Well, 10, 10 levels. Oh, OK. Yeah. 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 All right, for 10 price levels. Yeah, okay. with the volume, mm -hmm. and, you know. Yeah, this demo is a very simple simulator. Yeah.
Yes. You've been able to use this to identify which market we're able to go into, trending, being the by itself? Um, or, or you just right now test it on, on the case? Right. Uh, so we do turn it off sometimes. Uh, so we, we have it running when the, when the market's working the way it normally works. Uh, sometimes, like especially if there's news, like we, we will turn it off. Uh, we're continuing to advance it, though, uh, to the point where what we want to do is uh, hopefully not turn it off when that happens um, and actually make a lot more money then. Uh, there are traders that are pretty good at uh, guessing, you know, the direction of something um, through a news event. Uh, so um, we we want to try to model that, and um, that's that's a direction we're going. Those traders are very good because they have been looking at ten years of data. Right? <laughs> yeah. Here we are looking at big data, so there's a big difference. With those guys have been observing for ten yeah. years. Yeah. Well, we we are training on uh, a lot of historical data. Uh, so it's not like the you know in, in runtime in real time it's working off of what it's receiving, but when we train it, it's, uh, that network is built from millions of data points. Yeah. Uh, last question, probably. Yes. Have you ever tried about LSTM or I don't know, other other models or combined LSTM with reinforcement and try also? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we, we are using uh, RNN and LSTM right now on generating simulated market data. Uh, so it's similar, it's similar to speech recognition. Uh, you have uh, what happens next is largely dependent on what happened previously. So uh, that's also true in markets. And uh, we're, so we're using LSTM and RNN uh, for the data generation side. So like in the trading gym, we have these uh, generators for data, uh, and one of the ones that we're using internally is uh, RNN and LSTM that, that's actually generating simulated market data using, you know, these networks. And why not just combine the LSTM model with the reinforcement model, more than kind of good prediction? Yeah, well, it turns out that uh, if you have a history, like, so my history length in my example is one. Uh, if you use a history size of like five or ten, um, it's it's very similar to what an RNN does uh, with dropout, and um, so you know we might do it, but uh, we want to keep it as simple as we can as long as we can. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, One last question regarding the okay. activation function. Yeah. So did you try because as I understand, in neural network activation function is very important. The loss function which you define. Yeah. Um, so did you try yeah. the other, other activation functions? Or how was the result of it? Uh, so tan h and ReLU are the two ones that are used the most, and both of them work in in this just as just as well. Yeah, uh, I'm sure in you know some cases one will work better than the other, but TensorBoard's nice because you can change it and then you can see exactly what happens as a result of changing it. So it's it's quite easy to compare. Um, all right, let me turn this off and get the next speaker. Yeah. So thank you everybody. Thanks.